Hey guys, the following episode was pre-recorded when I was still publishing this podcast on the Beyond the Kill podcast network. Due to some creative differences, we're no longer going to be working together. So you may hear a couple references to their show throughout this episode. Just disregard them. If you want to watch or listen to this podcast, just search The Mindful Hunter in any of your favorite podcasting platforms and you'll find me there or look for me on YouTube. Thanks. Enjoy the episode. All right, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the third episode of The Mindful Hunter podcast. I am your host, Jay Nickel. So let's get the formal stuff out of the way. If you find this content valuable in any way whatsoever, it would really help me out if you would show that through whatever platform you're enjoying this content on. If it's a podcast, if you could rate the podcast, that would be really helpful. If it's on YouTube, a like or a comment would go really far. All these media sharing platforms these days are algorithm driven and the more uh, engagement that you have with your audience, the higher up the rankings the the content goes and the more eyeballs that it's likely to get. So it would really help me out if you guys would just take a second to do that if you find it valuable. If not, no stress, no worries. Sit back and, and listen away. I don't want you to feel obligated. No worries. Also, you can find this podcast on all major podcasting platforms. You can also go to my website, mindfulhunter.com. I will have a post there sharing all the ways that you can access this from Spotify to Apple Podcasts, or you can watch it on YouTube. So however you want to enjoy the content, it is up to you. As always, if you have questions or comments and you want to get in touch with me, you can DM me on Instagram, mindful underscore hunter. You can shoot me an email, j at mindfulhunter.com. Or you can leave a comment on the YouTube uh, show and I will see it there as well. And my YouTube is just mindful underscore hunter. The primary topic that we're going to cover in this week's episode is how Canadians can build points in the United States, specifically the Western United States, access hunting in the United States, take their guns down, bring trophies home, and how you can build a general kind of near, mid, and long-term strategy to take advantage of the, the multitude of hunting opportunities in the States. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, I thought it'd be really cool to hop into a bit of a Q&A. It was, I put out a request last week that if anybody had any questions or comments, they could feel free to get in touch. And somebody already reached out, which is super cool. It's great to see that level of engagement. So Stefan wrote in a question and he says, in your opinion, if you were to bump or push a buck or a buck or mule deer away from you into thicker timber, would you pull, pull back and set up in hopes of return later? Go in after it, despite the likely possibility of creating a lot of noise via branches, snow, etc., or return to that spot another day. He says in his case, he's kicking himself all the way back to camp for not being confident in his offhand shot and lack of preseason target practice. Any advice would be much appreciated. So we're going to back up and look at this question in a bit of a broader context. But before we do that, I want to take a moment and address the offhand shooting. I know Stefan's pissed here that he didn't take the opportunity but I'm glad that he saw it was from a lack of confidence, which may or may not be from a lack of skill. And when I got back to him, I said, I've never regretted a shot that I did not take as much as I've regretted a bad shot. Okay. Let me, let me, let me explain what I mean by that. Not, there's no consequences to not shooting other than you don't go home with an animal. That's not really that big of a deal. A bad shot any of you listeners or watchers out there who have placed a, a shit shot and either wounded an animal, blood tracked it for hours, not been able to find it, it's arguably one of the worst feelings in the world. There's this sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach and you can't escape it. And the only thing that keeps running through your mind is why did I take that shot? Why did I take that shot? Why did I take that shot? I think it was Renella that summed it up best. If you ask yourself, can I make this shot? That's enough doubt that you shouldn't take the shot. Taking a shot is something you should have supreme confidence in before doing it. So I commend Stefan in this case for not taking the shot because if he has any doubt at all, you're better off not taking it. Now, before we get into this specific bumped buck, I want to share a bit of a story. So I was on a spring bear hunt um, this spring and I was sitting in this one field three days in a row. And every day, this giant black bear with this huge white blaze on his chest 
would, would come in. I tried to put a stock on him the first day. I got to within 60 yards. I had, I was bow hunting, but I also had a rifle because there were grizzlies in the area. So I got to within 60 with my bow and got blown out. And then, so on the second day, didn't have a chance. And as I was going back in on the third day, my buddy who lives up in that area said, it's been pissing rain for the last three days. It really came down today. Tonight might be your last chance in that field. If you see that bear, I'd take a poke with the rifle because you might not see him again. So I was like, okay, sounds good to me. So yeah, believe it or not, I get to the field, it's pissing rain. And like, I think it was maybe six o'clock. It was earlier than that. It was about 4.30. The bear comes out. He's 300 yards away. It was raining really, really hard. It was a, this is an interesting situation. It was a flat field and I was having problems getting a prone position with enough elevation that I could actually still clearly see the bear. So I was kind of ended up kind of laying prone on this piece of deadfall. It wasn't the best rest. This is an exact example of the, you know, not taking a shot you shouldn't take that I just discussed. Um, by the way, most of the bad decisions I talk about on this podcast or advice against making bad decisions all come from previous examples where I already made the bad decision. So anyways, I'm sitting there. I decide to take this shot. I take the shot. It looks like I hit the bear, but he, he's really wet. I'm filming the whole thing, both myself shooting and the bear. The bear's gone into the timber and I can't figure out what's going on. So I start watching the, the footage and it kind, it looks like I hit him really far back. I'm going to skip ahead. It turns out my windage and my elevation on my turrets, somehow they'd gotten turned in transport. I had not fired before the hunt since the last time I'd fired the gun and my sight wasn't zeroed appropriately. I take full responsibility for that. There's no excuse for that, but shit happens and I, I placed a bad shot. So I go over there, I'm looking around, I can't see any blood. I look around, I walk around in the timber for about an hour, can't find any bear, can't find any blood, can't find anything. So I have the footage on my phone because I was using a phone scope to record the bear as I shot at it. And I'm playing it over and over and over. And the more I play it, it looks like I actually hit him really, really far back. At first, because of the way the water dispersed when the bullet hit him, I thought I made him, there's a femoral artery kind of in the crease of the hind thigh. And I thought that's where I'd shot him. So I thought maybe I did some damage, but it was just because the water spraying off the bear. And the more I looked at it, I'm like, I barely grazed this bear. And further to Stefan's question, I thought to myself, I wonder if this guy will come back. And I thought me tromping around, leaving my scent all over the place, isn't going to help matters whatsoever. So I'm going to pull out. So I pull out, I go back to my glass and spot, Maybe two and a half hours goes by and I shit you not, the bear comes walking out of the bush. And how do I know it's my bear? He has a four inch bald streak on his left ass cheek where the bullet grazed him. It was was barely a flesh wound. All it did was skin the hair off of his ass. And the dude came back. I did not take another shot on him. That night, I have footage. If you go watch the YouTube video, you can literally see the bald patch on the bear after he comes back out. Suffice it to say, there are definitely situations when the best thing to do is just pull out. I think it's pretty rare that a bear has been shot and come back to the exact same spot. So that's a bit of a severe example, but it does happen. There, there are some things I think we should take into consideration when we're trying to decide what to do. Species is going to play a, a big a big role because all species respond differently to getting bumped. I think terrain plays a major role and I think wind plays a major role. And I think the intensity of the bump also plays a major role. If they just felt something was off and kind of sauntered away, that's one thing. If they made eye contact, got spook and took off at a full sprint, that's a completely other thing. So let's say it's like a mild to moderate bump and it's a mule deer. What I would do is stop. I would wait less than five minutes. I would let things calm down. And then I would still hunt super, super slow and try and follow where I thought he went. And every time I got up to a place where my cover is going to be blown, like the edge of a ridge 
or coming around the corner of a hip. I would, I would be very, very careful because mule deer have this tendency of not going super far. Obviously there's exceptions to that. They also have a tendency of stopping and looking back. They want to verify that there's a reason to be chased. That's why I'm going to give it that initial two to three minutes. Because if I pursue him immediately and he looks back and sees me, that's going to be enough for him to just leave the whole area. But if he only ran 100, 150 yards and he looks back and he doesn't see me, that could be an, uh, the lack of confirmation could be enough for him to just chill out, go back to feeding, bed back down, do whatever he's going to do. So if that was a situation, that's what I would do. Give it five or six minutes and then still hunt back along the path that you think he took. Now, if it's a whitetail, I don't have much uh, traditional whitetail hunting experience, but I've hunted coos deer in Arizona for two years. You bump a coos deer, go home. Those things are like running to the next county. No questions asked. Even if they get like a spidey sense tingle, them bastards are gone. So at that point, go look for another buck. There is zero point whatsoever in chasing down any of the whitetails that I've ever gone after. And I think, I think it's safe to say that for all um, subspecies of whitetail. Bear, on the other hand, especially given the time of year, here's the thing about bears. Bears are predators. So they don't have that natural fear tendency like prey animals do. So bear is another one you got to take it. I've had so many encounters where I bumped a bear, backed out, let it cool down, went back in, smoked the bear. So those are ones, bear and mule deer, I think you definitely have another shot. The last one I'll touch on because I don't have a whole lot of experience with many other species is elk. I would say with elk, it's scent over everything. If they see you and didn't like you and like kind of walked away, you can recover from that. If they got a snoot full of you, they're probably gone. However, if it's the middle of the rut and you can call, you can definitely bring a bring an elk back. You'll know that right away though. Like if you if you bump them and you bugle or you cow call and there's just nothing and you just hear trampling hooves, then just move on. But if within 30 seconds you can get them calling back to you or you can hear them kind of hang up and stop running away, you can definitely make another play. I've done that before plenty of times. If the wind is not in your favor in any of these situations, just stop. Don't worry about it. Try and go find another play. But if the wind is in your favor, that's kind of another point in your pocket that you should continue on after this particular animal. You may got a shot. One last note that I'm, that I'm thinking about it will be the presence of, of does or cows. Yeah, with bears, that's not the case because they don't hang out like that. So like a, a sow wouldn't be around a boar anyways. But if the buck is with does, watch the does. If the does didn't leave, the buck will likely be back. Same thing with the cows and the bull. If the cows stuck around and the bull took off, just pull back, chill out. The bull will come back to the cows or the buck will come back to the does for sure. All right. I hope that was helpful, Stefan. Thank you very much for standing, sending in the question. And anybody else who has some questions, feel free to send them in. I'm really looking forward to kind of digging in deeper. Um, and hopefully I've got some more funny stories. Okay. Let's get into the weekly training update. Essentially, my training program continues on the way it has for the last couple podcasts, primarily lifting five days a week, weighted backpack cardio with a 50 pound backpack, hour and a half hike uh, once a week, and then a little bit of cardio pre and post lifting. So the topic, the training topic I wanted to get into today, because it's particularly poignant for me uh, recently, is training around problem areas. So I'm pretty sure it's from archery. It's funny. Um, Wardo, a guy who runs another podcast on this network, just did a podcast on shoulder pain for archers. I essentially, I think it's from shooting too much or not warming up enough. I basically have a bit of a weak spot right where my, the bicep tendon implants itself into the shoulder. And there's a few exercises that really tend to aggravate it. And I found myself not willing to like work around it. Like I just kept aggravating it with the same exercises. This week I went in and I was like, well, let's just not do the exercises that, that bother my shoulder and I'll do some other stuff. So I worked around it and my shoulder feels great. Now I am taking some time off of the bow because it's not bow season. And I think it's a good idea to just give your body a break from repetitive stress activities now and again. But it brought to mind the fact that we could all probably use a bit of a reminder to like stick the ego in the back pocket 
when it comes to injuries. I think it's wise to seek professional help when necessary. I think a lot of prehab, like warm-ups and priming and band work can be really helpful. But I think sometimes, like I'm 42, some shit's just old and beat up on me. And I think sometimes the best answer, it's like that old thing, you go to the doctor and it's like, I hurt when I do this. And he goes, well, stop doing that. So that was my little, my little nugget, my hot tip for this week. If there's a couple of exercises that are aggravating old aches and pains for you, just ditch them. Stop doing them. This is also, I've had this happen in the past as well. I've taken it out of my routine for like six months, did completely different exercises, and then went back to it and it didn't bother me anymore because I had a chance to like kind of strengthen up the supporting tissue around that particular area. So that would be another element that I would add to that tip. Just because you can't do it today doesn't mean you'll never be able to do it again. And if you're curious, the worst one for me is a, is a flat dumbbell bench press, which is like my favorite exercise in the world. And I think that's why I'm having problems giving it up. I'm very strong on that exercise, kind of feeds the ego, looks cool. Yeah, I just have a hard time dropping it from my routine. So, but I've made the decision. It's not worth it. I'll, I will stick to a machine or I was going to say flat bench press, but that's even worse. If flat bench press as a whole is a terrible exercise for the most part, for most people's um biomechanics and mine in particular. I have particularly long arms and a shallow rib cage, which makes bench press like a very difficult exercise for me to do appropriately and not just basically turning it into a shoulder and tricep exercise. Anyways, long rant. The short story is if it hurts, don't do it. Weekly diet update. So coach is slowly raising food. My weight's slowly going up. I'm about 252 pounds right now. So I got another four pounds to get back to my all time high at 256. And then about my ultimate goal for this bulking cycle is to put on another 10 pounds after that. So uh, you know what? I'll figure out my macros for next podcast. I don't even know what they are because I don't pay attention to them. I just eat what he tells me to eat, but I'll figure them out for next week. So I can kind of give you guys a rolling calendar of, of the changes that he's making to them. But the one thing that I thought it, uh, that I would share is that there's kind of um, a counterintuitive or a non-intuitive reason that bodybuilding foods are so simple and clean, like rice, chicken, beef, and we eat the same things every single day. It's because if you're trying to put on or take off weight, weight you can make mild adjustments to each meal. Like I'm just going to eat 50 grams less of rice at each meal or 50 grams more of rice at each meal. And that will create the caloric deficit or excess that you're hoping to create. And it's super easy. You don't have to count macros. You don't even really have to know exactly how many calories you're eating a day. Whereas if you eat a typical random diet of just whatever you feel like that day, you could still do like an, if it fits your macros, but you literally have to calorie count every single thing that goes in your body. It's also not taking into, a, in, into account like the micronutrient differences between foods, different sodium intakes, all of that can play a large role in your body composition. Basically, this is a long-winded way of saying, if you have some type of body composition goal, you're looking to lose weight or you're looking to put on weight, one of the benefits of eating a simple, replicable diet every single day is that you can just make mild changes to the amounts it's very simple, low degree of error, and easy to execute, and you'll see immediate results. I, it was just a little a kind of epiphany that I had today, and I thought I would share that. All right, let's talk about this week's piece of new gear, outdoor research crocs. They're actually called crocodiles. They're gators, so you can see the kind of play on words with calling them crocodiles. Um, and I'd seen somebody else post a question about, about gators. I have a very firm opinion on gators and it's kind of a, a more overarching principle. I look at experts in a field and then try and buy gear from them. I'm probably going to buy a tent from Hilleberg because Hilleberg just makes tents. I'm probably going to buy a pack from Kafaru because Kafaru just makes backpacks. Now outdoor research doesn't just make Crocs, so it's not completely true to the principle, but they are experts in gator construction. They've been making these exact gators. I don't even know how long. I bought my first pair of outdoor research Crocs probably almost 20 years ago for my first season tree planting. There's several reasons, in my opinion, why, why these are the best gators, hands down. Part of it is, is the width of the Velcro strap at the front. That's what actually keeps the gators upright on your legs. 
Cheaper gaiters with thinner Velcro straps tend to slide down your calf. Even if you try and tighten the top, it doesn't work very well. As soon as they get wet or covered with mud, they slide down. But the Velcro is so stiff on OR gaiters that it keeps them elevated. All the construction materials are top notch. Their warranty is really good. The cost is very reasonable. They're either 85 or 95 Canadian dollars. And just for my money, these are the only gaiters that I have an interest in buying. I haven't been wearing gaiters for the past couple of years just because the type of hunting I do, I don't typically require it, but I'm doing this winter goat hunt and for sure I want gaiters because I don't want snow getting inside my pants or down my boots. So new piece of gear for the week, Outdoor Research Crocodiles. They're gaiters, highly recommend them, can't go wrong. So time to get in the weekly current event. The one I'm going to discuss today isn't really current, however, I think it's still worth discussion. So Meat Eater just released season one and season two of, of their TV series onto YouTube for free. So I went back and watched them because it's been years since I've seen the first episodes and they're really good. Actually, I forgot how bad season one was. They did that like quick dramatic cuts, you know, heavy rock music, keep everything fast and moving. And it was like, what is this shit? And you get into season two and it's night and day. It's like, oh, they found their groove. Like, you're supposed to be the thinking man's hunting show, not some piece of shit. Um, anyways, I had to chuckle. It's it. Yeah, they really found their groove in season two. But I was watching a doll sheep hunting episode and they go black bear hunting for the last day of this hunt. And I forget the gentleman's name. He's an, he's an ex sheep guy from Idaho and he works for Vortex now. I think his name's Paul. I don't want Paul to take this the wrong way and I don't want it to be misconstrued, but Paul ends up shooting a bear on the show. And it is a tiny, tiny bear. I don't mean like a five and a half footer small bear. I mean like a four footer small bear. Like, man, it, I don't, it might not even weigh a hundred pounds. Like it was tiny. And I was thinking to myself, like, really, man? Like, I don't know. This really opens up a can of worms and I'm sure I'm going to piss some people off and I don't want to, because here's the deal. At the end of the day, if it's ethical and it's legal and you feel good about it, I'm not going to judge you for it. So I want this to be kind of like a hypothetical conversation, not a condemnation of somebody's actions. And I'm only talking about this because I've been there myself. I've shot the tiny spike buck because I wanted to shoot something. I'd hunted all season. It was a legal buck to shoot. If the wildlife managers didn't want spike bucks being shot, then they would have put some type of antler restriction in that area. So before anybody starts sending in a bunch of hate mail, it's not like I haven't done this myself, but that was also earlier on in my hunting career. So pause right there. And let's examine the concept of trophy hunting, because this is one of the most incendiary terms in our industry. I'm going to use it with you guys because we have a joint understanding of what it means. Let me share what I think trophy hunting means. Trophy hunting is the point in your development as a hunter when you realize killing certain animals is no longer fair and you have evolved to a place with your own skill set where you want adversaries that are worthy of your attention and you start targeting larger, older, more mature examples of the species because they're craftier, they're wiser, and they're harder to kill. And when you're successful in those battles, it is a trophy because you have set forth a challenge that is worth your time and energy, and it's slightly out of your reach. It should be something that's a little bit harder than anything else you've ever done before. Like you should keep raising that bar. And every time you raise that bar and every time you're able to meet that challenge and take that animal that was a little bit older, a little bit wiser, a little bit bigger, there's a reason to rejoice in that. And there's a reason to have pride in that fact. And then yes, those antlers are regarded as a trophy of that accomplishment. Absolutely. That is not what the general public assumes with the word trophy. So I want to make it ultimately clear. That's how I feel about the word trophy. Now let's get to, back to Paul and his black bear. Like this dude was easily in his forties or fifties. He'd been hunting in his whole life. I'll pose the hypothetical question. Should he have shot the black bear? You know, one could say, 
I went all the way to Alaska. I wanted to go home with something like a memory. It was a legal bear. I'm going to say, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Here's the reason why I'm bringing this up. And I could be seeing, reading more into the situation than was really there. But there was a look between Steve and Paul when they walked up on the bear. And I've like, I've had that look before. And that is like a shit, man. I probably shouldn't have shot that thing. Look, that's what that look is. So I'm like, I feel pretty confident. He was a little disappointed in himself for doing it. I could be wrong. I don't want to put words in his mouth. But the question to you guys is like, what's okay and what's not okay? And is this a question along a spectrum? And are there different answers to this question depending on where you're at in your development? Anyways, again, I don't want to have any judgments about this. I just thought it was an interesting topic for discussion. So as always, get in touch with me and let me know your thoughts on this. And I'll bring it back into a future uh, discussion later on because I think it's really interesting. Okay, so let's dive into the main topic for the week, which is how to hunt in the United States, how to build points, and what to do with those points once you start building them. So this is going to be a two-part series. Part one, I'm going to focus on access. And I don't mean so much land access, but I mean, what are the barriers between you and hunting in the US? Like getting your gun down there, getting your antlers back home. What do you do with meat? Um, what do you need for identification at the, at the border as far as like weapons go? I'm going to handle all that kind of stuff in this episode. And then I'm also going to go through all the main issues that kind of vary state by state that you need to keep in mind that will affect your strategy. Next week, what I'm going to do is get into the actual state by state breakdown, and I'm going to do that species by species, how the point systems work in each state, how to, what, you know, what my recommendations are for the states that are worth building points, the different costs, basically state by state, break it all down into, into the minute details. Also, I'm going to provide se several options for people. So listen, if you just want the quick and cheap, listen, I want to go down once every three or four years. I'm going to tell you how to spend 50 bucks a year on a point in Wyoming and basically get um, an over-the-counter elk tag every three years. Super, super simple, clean, easy. If you're, well, you want more complexity and you get off on reading harvest statistics and you want to build out like a four species strategy to have hunts every single year for different species in different states, we're going to get into that shit too. That's kind of along the level of complexity that I particularly operate at. So I hope to cover a variety of strategies for a variety of individuals, depending on what your particular interests are. So before we get into details, I'm going to share a little bit of my experience hunting in the States, just so you know that I'm not talking out of my ass and I've actually done this a couple times. So I have rifle hunted and archery hunted in the States. I'm going to go through the list of where I've hunted. This is not bragging in any way, shape or form. There's people who are way better hunters than I am. I am a moderately successful hunter at best, but I just want to establish my credibility to talk about this topic. So I have killed an Audad in Texas with a rifle. I have rifle hunted in Wyoming unsuccessfully for elk. I've killed a mule deer with a rifle in Montana. I've killed an elk with a bow in New Mexico. I've killed a mule deer with a bow in Arizona. And I've killed a goat with a bow in Maui. And those go about 50-50 guided versus uh, DIY. So when I go to Arizona, that's guided, but it's an over-the-counter tag. Anybody can go on that hunt. Hawaii was also guided. Hawaii, you don't even need tags though, because they're all invasive species. You buy a $105 hunting license and you can do whatever you want. It's mostly private land on Maui though. So really what you're paying for is just access to bush country. There's no high fence operations on Maui or anything like that. So it's still hunting. Hunting is just access is the issue. Texas was, was guided. Montana was do it yourself and uh, New Mexico was do it yourself. That's kind of like the highlight of my hunting career, taking an elk solo with my bow at 10,000 feet in New Mexico. It took me five years to kill my first elk. And I'm, I'm really proud of that accomplishment. Most of those hunts you can go watch on my YouTube. Now for each of those hunts, I had to get a weapon in and out of the country. And if I was successful carcass out of the country and antlers 
out of the country. And I'm going to go into how I was able to do that each of those times. But anyways, just wanted to build some credibility. Yes, I've done this many, many times, and I understand the system fairly thoroughly. Next up, I'm going to share the states that I choose to build points in. This is not necessarily the state list you have to decide upon, but I'll get into why I chose these st- these states later. So I have points currently in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Nevada, Arizona, Utah. That's it. I do not do points in Washington or California or Oregon. There's reasons for each of those. I don't do them in Idaho because it's a... It, In Idaho, you can only buy points for like once in a lifetime animals and they're all animals we have here. So there's no point and their elk and deer are over the counter tags for the most part. They do have some smaller units Um, and New Mexico doesn't have points. You can't accrue points in New Mexico. It's like a pure lottery every year. Um, Anyways, that being said, I'll get into the complexities of that later on, but there are seven states in total that I have points in. I no longer buy points in Colorado. In my opinion, the pressure is just getting too great. So there's no point. Um, so that's kind of like a dead state to me, but there are six states that I actively buy points in every year. The other thing that is interesting is that I choose not to buy points in Washington or Oregon because in my opinion, they're too close to home. I really don't see the point in, go- in going to all the trouble to get across the border and get tags and deal with all the hassle to hunt in a place that's eerily similar to British Columbia. The whole point of going across the border is to like hunt in new country, that fabled romantic Western US, you know, um, that you've seen in the movies and read in the books and, you know, the Alpine and kind of the broken timber of Wyoming. And it's like the kind of landscape that we don't really have here. Um, So for that reason, that's why I stay out of Washington and Oregon. I think there's some cool opportunities in those states. But neither of those states have non-resident pools that are particularly favorable to non-residents. And the terrain and landscape is very similar to BC, so I just don't bother. The next thing that I'm going to get into is the difference between a non-resident or a resident and a non-resident. Because most people are like, well, how can I buy points as a Canadian when I don't live in the States? Here's the crazy thing about the States. Every single state has a resident and non-resident pool. That pool will have different rules and regulations, and there will be tags in each of those pools. To qualify to apply or buy from the non-resident pool, you just have to be not from that state. So let's say you want a mule deer tag in Montana. It does not matter if you live in Texas or Australia. You just don't live in Montana. They don't give a shit where you live. The only exception to that is Alaska. Okay. If you are not an American citizen, you cannot do it yourself hunt in Alaska. You have to go with a guide. It's kind of shitty because there's so many like drop off caribou hunts or Kodiak blacktail hunts that are like pretty reasonable for access. Like you're basically playing for a float plane ride and a drop off. And there's really good game opportunities there. But as a Canadian citizen, you cannot access those. You need to go with a guide if you're going to hunt with Alaska. That's the only state that operates like that. Every other state, as long as you're a non-resident, it doesn't matter. Next up, let's talk rifles. What you need is the ATF form 6NIA. Literally type into Google ATF 6NIA. A, a form will immediately come up. Now, you need to have a tag in order to fill out this form because there's a place on there where you have to say what state you have a hunt in already. Like, a, like you need to prove that, that a state has agreed to let you come and hunt there. Now, there's certain states like Texas that have non-native animals where as long as you buy a hunting license, you are legally allowed to kill a certain like, okay, odd dad or non-native in Texas. Once you buy a hunting license, you buy a five-day non-resident hunting license in Texas, you could smoke 50 odd dad. Nobody gives a shit. So in that case, if you have that hunting license, you can still fill out this form um, because there's animals that you can kill without a tag. But just like in British Columbia, you got to have a hunting license and you got to buy tags on top of that. 
Most states work like that as well. So just know you get your tags first and that's fine. Most of the draws come out between March and June. The hunts don't happen until the fall. So you have like four months to figure out your rifle. It takes like a week. So basically what you do, download that form, fill it out. It's super simple. You put the serial numbers of your, of the gun you want to take, how much ammo you're going to bring. It's very basic. And then you put your tag information on there and you email it in. They used to, the old ones you used to fax. So if you're filling one out and it's asking you to fax it, you need to go download the updated one that came out in 2018. You email it in. I've done this three times. Every time I've gotten it back in less than two weeks. I'm going to say, give yourself six weeks because sometimes you'll fuck up. I made a mistake one year. They came back to me in two weeks. They were super cool. They said, you've been denied because of X, Y, and Z. Um, I forget exactly what I did. If I had like the wrong address somewhere, it was like a very like paper pushy error, but it was an error nonetheless, but it was like July. I still had tons of time, filled it back out, emailed it back in another week later, they send you a PDF. That'll be a scanned copy of the one that they've stamped and signed from the ATF. All you need to do. And here's the cool thing. So let's say you get a mule deer tag in Montana. You fill out your six NIA. You, you get qualified to bring your rifle over the border. Now you can do anything you want for an entire year. You can go anywhere in the States with your rifle. So now that you got that hunt, maybe I'll go pick up an over the counter tag in Idaho and stay down for an extra two weeks or uh, go back in the spring for a bear in Montana. The, the permit is good for one calendar year. And to be honest, I usually do this every year just in case like, oh, maybe I decide to pick up a late season tag somewhere. Um, I will renew my permit every year. So that's super handy. Now I have found the border guys as a general rule are super cool people. However, they are not always up to snuff on all the hunting regulations because it's pretty rare that Canadians cross the border hunting. Normally I get more like interested dudes asking me questions about what I'm going to do than anything else. I'm telling you this because do your research. Don't expect to go there and they know exactly what you're doing and exactly what pieces of paper you should have and exactly what state your rifles should be in. Like that's on you. So my recommendation is always ammo separate from the rifle, separate locked cases, no ammo with the rifle, trigger lock on the rifle in a locked case, ammo, separate locked case. Yes, this is overkill. I don't give a shit better safe than sorry. And I print out two copies of my six NIA. I leave one copy in the rifle case and that's because they're likely going to go inspect your vehicle. And then when they open it and see it there, the message is this dude is super organized. He's on the up and up. I'm just going to let him through. So it's better to be overprepared than underprepared. And when you show up, when you drive up to the border, it's the first word out of your mouth. Like, how you doing, sir? I'm good. I just want to let you know, I have a rifle and ammunition in the vehicle. Nothing is loaded. Here's my six NIA. I'm here to go hunting. Clean, simple. Don't got to apologize, but get it out of the way quick. Because if you're like three, four questions deep and it doesn't come up, then it's going to like be weird. So my recommendation is just like own it right out of the gate. Plus then you are establishing the perception that you know what you're doing. So you don't, you're not making them feel like they should interrogate you because you're organized, you're calm, you're confident. I've only ever had my truck ripped apart once and it wasn't even that bad. And it was on the way home and we were there for maybe an hour and they kind of went through everything and I went back out and everything was all over the place. Like it, you know, is when that happens every other time. And I've taken a rifle over, I don't know, half a dozen times now. Every other time has been super clean. A couple of times they've gone out to the truck, but it's literally just go into the truck, open my rifle, check serial numbers, close my rifle, come back in. So be organized and be over-prepared as opposed to under-prepared. The same goes with meat. So you can bring meat and bones back and forth no problem. There is no legal requirement to have documentation. You do need to have your tag with you. So you never throw out your tag. And most states will have like two parts of the tag. The one part of the tag that you attach to the animal and like a second part. Even that second part is good enough. Like if you've left your antlers at a taxidermist 
which I'm going to get into in a minute, obviously that tag has to stay with those antlers. Having the second part of the tag or a picture of the tag on your cell phone has always worked for me. They don't really care if it's meat or bones. Here's the exception, unprocessed skulls. There are two different ways to interpret the kind of legislation or the regulations on unprocessed skulls. I have had people tell me who are in the know that you can bring them back and forth, no problem. However, there is enough of a discrepancy there that I choose to interpret the regulations that you cannot transport an unprocessed skull across the border. By unprocessed, I mean anything that's not a euro. Like don't clean it out with a pressure washer and think that's good to going to be good enough because they could take your skull and antlers at the border. I've brought home antlers lots. I've never had a problem. Here's my tip. Drop it off at a taxidermist close to the border. There's a great guy in Evergreen, 10 point taxidermy. He's done t- like multiple euros for me. I just swing by his place on the way home from a hunt, drop off my skull and antlers, cross the border with my meat, go home. Two months later, he gives me a call. I drive back across the border. I still got my tag in my pocket. I pick up my beautiful white euro mount drive across the border, no problem at all. So my firm recommendation to everybody is have all your mounts and taxidermy done in the States. So here's the other thing. If you're not hunting close to the border and you're going to have your taxidermy done um, further down South, it's much easier to have them ship it up to the border to like 24 seven parcel or one of those shipping services. And then you drive across the border and pick it up because to have Um, someone ship taxidermy across is kind of complicated. Now, if you're getting a registered taxidermist to get it done in the States, they know how to do that. It'll just cost a bit of money if that's what you want to do. Like, let's say you don't live close to the border, but for people who live fairly close to the lower mainland or don't mind a, a short drive or can pair it with another reason to come to Vancouver, I recommend driving it over yourself. So either drive across and pick it up close to the border or have the taxidermist ship it up to the border and you go get it yourself. Now, as far as a bow goes, you can drive back and forth with a bow all day long. It does not legally require any permitting whatsoever. So do whatever you want with that. The other thing that I recommend is if you're going to fly to your hunt, drive across first. It's just simpler. I have flown, um, with meat across the border. Uh, I've never flown with antlers across the border. Um, and I don't think I've flown with a rifle across the border. I haven't. If you're in the lower mainland or if you're in the Okanagan and close to the border, I recommend driving across the border, flying from a place like Bellingham, because it's way easier to deal with all this shit when you're in your truck and you're driving across. It's like a, a brief conversation and it's done. When you get to an airport, people get like a little more hanky and you, it might be a little more complicated. It's still perfectly legal. You'll still be totally fine. Just when I'm doing these types of things, I'm looking for the easiest solution possible. And in my experience, driving across the border, then getting on a flight is far easier. Plus the flights are dirt cheap. You can literally fly from Bellingham down to Tucson for 120 bucks round trip. So, I mean, that's another argument to do it that way. Now that covers most of the access related issues or barriers or friction that you might run into trying to get to the States. So there's two websites or services, I guess, that I want to bring up that I want you to keep in mind for the rest of this conversation. And it's Go Hunt and Onyx. So Go Hunt is a website that compiles all the draw result results and harvest data from the variety of different state organization and compiles it in a really easy to use interface. They also have a ton of content on like the different regulations for the different states and you know, when the draws start and when the deadlines are for submission and just like, it's basically just a hub for everything you would ever want to know about applying for points in the States. Now it's 150 bucks a year to get insider access, but they will give you a $50 gift certificate to their gear shop when you buy it. And their gear shop has tons of shit. You will definitely be able to find something for 50 bucks. So it's basically a hundred bucks a year. I highly recommend this. The second resource I'm going to recommend is Onyx. One of the questions people asked me when I was preparing for this podcast is how do I access public land in the States? I'm going to get into deeper detail about specifically how to do that in a state by state, um, way, 
But I will say I use Onyx for everything that I do in the States. It is a phenomenal mapping tool. I even use it in Canada for like my points and stuff and preparing my maps for all of my hunts because I trust it. I've been using it for almost five years. It has never failed on me. I have never had it go down in the back country. You load all your maps up on your cell phone. Even when you've got no cell phone service, your GPS works flawlessly. It is head and shoulders above anything else. Now, there are competitors on the market. Some of them are cheaper. I've heard great things about base map. You can use it if you want to. When it comes to mission critical shit, I go with what I know and I go with what I trust. And I've used Onyx so long, it's never failed me. So I continue to use Onyx. So that's what I'm going to recommend. You can do whatever you want. All right, now let's get into the actual differences between the states and what like an overall plan could look like. So first of all, my general plan is that I want a slightly above average hunt every one to two years. I want a really good hunt every three to four years. And I want like a super excellent, potentially once in a lifetime hunt every 10 to 15 years. And by playing multiple species in multiple states, it's super possible to do this. I've already been doing it for the last five years. The tag that I drew in New Mexico was one of those once in a lifetime ones. I had less than a 1% chance of drawing. There were 11 tags in that unit for non-residents. I drew one. I was in the back country for five days. I saw no less than 50 elk per day, at least 10 bulls. I heard bugling the majority of the time I was there and I did not see a single living person in the back country. So that's an example. It happens. Um, your, your other hunts, like a general season Montana mule deer tag, you can pull that every two years, a general, uh, season elk tag in Wyoming. You can pull that every three years. So the idea is, and we're going to get into the complexities of this a little bit later on, you start playing the states off of each other and rotating and being like, okay, I'll go to Montana every third year. I'll go to Wyoming every fourth year. I'll do an over-the-counter tag in Arizona on my off years. And you just, you just circulate through the species and through the states. And you're always kind of pulling something half decent. And then every now and then you get this super gangster tag. Every state follows different rules and they essentially have a different cost structure, a different draw structure and a different wildlife mandate. There are other differences as well. And we're going to get into those. So let's talk about cost structure. Some States like Wyoming, you pay up front. So when you apply for an elk tag in Wyoming, you buy the tag. When the draw comes out, if you're not drawn, you get a refund back onto your credit card. So if cash flow is an issue, you want to keep an eye on these buy ahead states. Other tags like Arizona, you just buy your points. So if I buy a deer point, it's 10 bucks. If I buy an elk point, it's 10 bucks. And then if you actually draw the tag, then your credit card gets dinged for the tag fee. Small note, if they go to pull money off a credit card and the credit card is expired or doesn't have enough room on it, they don't ask again and you don't get drawn again. That's it. Your chance is gone. Some people I know actually have a special draw credit card, and it's the only thing they use it for because they'll put a lot of money on it at the beginning of the draw application season, but then 99% of that money is going to go back onto the credit card because you're not actually going to have to pay for any of that stuff. Then you don't have to worry about it being expired and you don't have to worry about it being full. But just a note, Make sure that information is up to date on a state by state basis. Otherwise you could lose the opportunity that you would have gotten otherwise. Let's get into draw structure. This is where shit starts to get a little bit complicated and it kind of matters and it kind of doesn't. So I don't want you to get overwhelmed. There is a difference between how states handle bonus points. So you're also going to hear the world bonus point and preference point. And I have found that there is no real consistent difference between the two. There used to be five years ago. Preference points meant one thing and bonus points meant another. That's not really the case anymore. So just, to, just, just know that you need to be familiar with each state and how they handle both. Because some states have preference points for one thing and bonus points for another. For example, in Montana, if you want to draw an over the count. Well, it's not over the counter because you got to draw, but their general open season elk tag, you have to apply for the big game combo as a non-resident. And 
you can't, you have to have preference points. You really only need one point to draw it. Sometimes you need two. It depends on how many people apply that year, but that's the only thing those preference points are good for. They're 50 bucks. You can buy them at the end of the year before September 30th, or you can buy them going into that draw, but they won't, they don't actually count as part of your preference points on file until after that draw season. Now, they also have bonus points. So let's say you wanted to go in for a limited entry draw unit in Montana. You would need one, and let's say it was a three-point unit. You would need one preference point to qualify for the big game combo license, and then you would need three bonus points to qualify for that particular unit. Yes, you have to buy both of these, and yes, it adds up. So... I, and again, we're going to get into each state and the individual complexities. I'm just kind of lay out the different dimensions that you need to keep aware of when you're getting into this. And again, that's why I recommend a state like Go Hunt because I forget this shit all the time. And I'll just go up, look up Montana. Oh yeah, right. That's what I need to do in Montana. Go and buy or apply and do whatever I need to do. Now, in addition to that, some states like Colorado operate primarily on a max point system which means that for the more prime units, it could be an 18 point unit. That means only people with 18 points are ever gonna draw that unit. And basically what would happen is that everyone who applies for that unit who has 18 points would go into a bucket. And if they had 10 tags, they would just draw 10 of those guys out. That's a max point system. A place like Nevada squares your bonus points. So there might be a, a harder to draw um, unit. If you have two points, you are essentially going to have four entries in the bucket for that unit. If you had 10 points, you're going to have 100 entries in the bucket for that unit. But in a squared point system or in a true like random bonus point system, you always got a shot. You know what I mean? It might be... 0.1%, but there's a 0.1%. In a max point system, you have no chance if you don't have enough points. The reason you want to keep that in mind is some states you have to apply to every X amount of years to keep your points active, and it's to try and stop point creep. So what you can do is just apply for a unit that you have no chance in drawing, and then they'll you go on file as applying, you didn't get your tag, you get your bonus point for that this year, and you just keep keeping on. So now we recognize there's a difference between bonus points and preference points, and there's a difference in how each state treats those points for given circumstances. Dates for application. Every state has a different deadline, and every state has a different draw date. When we get into the strategy building, you want to keep this front of mind because sometimes there's a few states up front that you can apply for. And if you draw, you don't apply for the back end states. There is sometimes a danger of pulling multiple tags, but you can decrease that danger by applying for some really hard tags in some places and easy tags in other places. There used to be a beautiful way to take advantage of this. Wyoming, the draw was in like February every year. So you could just like I want to go to Wyoming. I'll apply to Wyoming. Don't apply anywhere else. If you draw Wyoming, great. Don't apply anywhere else. Just collect points everywhere. If you don't draw Wyoming, then just start applying to every other place. They have now changed that and they don't draw the non-resident tags till like fucking March or April or something. So that doesn't work anymore. Side note, some states allow refunds. Some states don't. So, um, keep that in mind. Cause if you draw a duplicate tag, there may be an opportunity to get a refund. Some of them do offer refunds, but they're like, you need a death certificate or like some crazy excuse to take advantage. Other States like Montana, you can just have 80% of your tag back. Anytime you draw a tag, let's say I, then I draw a killer, like strip deer tag in Arizona. You just send them an email in Montana. Say, I want to return my tag. They'll give you 80% of your money back all your bonus points stay intact and you just void the tag for that year. Now let's talk about how different states manage wildlife. For the most part, a state will either manage for quality or opportunity. Example, Idaho manages for opportunity. They have a shitload of elk tags and a shitload of deer tags. 
almost an infinite amount. They did run out this year, but for the most part, if you want to buy a tag, you just give me your 400 bucks. You can go hunt elk with all the other yahoos. The results of that are high pressure, low trophy class, but it makes a lot of revenue for the state. Tags are also normally cheaper in opportunity states than quality states. New Mexico is the opposite. They manage for quality, not opportunity. Very few tags, but they're expensive. An elk tag is a thousand bucks. U.S. But if you get a tag in New Mexico, there is a damn good chance you're going to kill a monster, whatever, bull, buck, you name it. Um, then there's some states that do a combination. Colorado, for example, manages for quality of mule deer and opportunity in elk. So this is just another data point you want to take into account when you're building out your strategy is that for the states that are more opportunity based, and I would say Montana and Wyoming are largely opportunity, but like just with a hair of quality mixed in, you are probably going to have better odds in opportunity states, but you're going to encounter more pressure and smaller animals, but at least you're out there hunting. The, the quality states are the ones you're going to draw less often. Now, here's where you can kind of work the system. Arizona is crazy hard to draw a decent limited entry tag. You're looking at 15 years as a non-resident, and that's not even on the strip. You want to get on the strip, you're looking at 20. I shit you not. However, I can go buy a, an over-the-counter coos tag or mule deer tag and go hunt a general open season unit, and I'm still going to have an Arizona hunting experience. I'm going to be out in the desert. There's fucking cactus everywhere. It's super hot. It's like crazy. And it's like no place you've ever hunted before. So there's ways to go to places and have cool experiences and not get hung up on the individual regulations of that state. So keep that in mind as well. Okay. Also I apply for deer and elk points in every single state, um, because there's lots of opportunities. Some states I apply for the more trophy animals, the sheep or goat, um, in no states do I apply for bear bison or moose. And that's because we have way better opportunities here at home. They're cheaper. They're more plentiful. There's no reason to do that stuff down South. It's too expensive. And the opportunity and the animal size is just not worth it. Even when it comes to sheep and stuff, some States it's going to take you so many points to draw a decent tag. There's no point. Other States, I'm pretty sure it's Arizona. We'll get into it on the next episode. It's like a $10 bonus point. And you buy all five species, it costs you 50 bucks a year. So who gives a shit? It's an extra 10 bucks. So I just, I buy the sheep tag, I buy the sheep points every year and maybe by, you know, in 15 or 20 years, I'll end up on a sheep hunt in Arizona, which is super cool. I also don't tend to buy pronghorn or antelope points. It's not that I don't think they're cool. It's that there's a lot of really good over the counter opportunity for antelope. So when I'm in a position where I want to do an antelope hunt, I'll probably just do an over the counter option because they're not one of my main species of interest. It's just not, you got to decide where to draw the line at some point, as far as the points that you're going to accrue long-term. Now with all that complexity out of the way, I will share this. There are companies that will manage this entire process for you. You can pay them a bit of a fee. You can tell them what your short, mid, and long-term goals are. They will build out a plan. They will apply for you every year. They will try and find hunts that meet with your goals. I'm not going to recommend anyone in particular because I've never utilized their services, so I don't want to vouch for people that I haven't personally worked with. I'm a data nerd. I love looking at draw results and harvest statistics and trying to find that like one little nugget like oh, here's a unit that actually has a, a really high harvest success rate, really low hunter pressure, and like people just aren't onto it yet. So I love doing this shit for myself. And by nature, I don't trust people. So I would be worried that they would be actually putting as much energy into it as I would. However, that being said, if you've got some cash and you'd rather outsource this problem, you can totally do that. Just Google it. There's a couple really big, really reputable firms that do this. I just haven't used them. Also, like I said at the beginning, just because I realized the last 20 minutes may have overwhelmed a lot of people and you're like, fuck this, it's not worth the effort. Remember, I'm going to give the cheap and dirty and I'm going to give the expensive and complex. So if you just want to go to Wyoming every three years, I'm going to tell you how to pay 50 bucks a year and go on an archery elk hunt or a rifle elk hunt every three years in Wyoming. I've been down there. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. And for that little money, there's really no reason not to go. It's a hell of a great experience. So I'm going to wrap it up for today. That went on longer than I expected. 
game plan for next week. We're going to get into the nitty gritty. We're going to go state by state, break down the rules and regulations of each state, what animals I think are worth applying for, and what the differences are between each of the states and each of the species. Then I'm going to close out with my own personal strategy. So I'm going to tell you exactly what I do, what my plans are, what I'm hoping to hunt this year. I've already told you what I hunt in the past. I'll probably even break out my spreadsheet and show you how many points I've gotten, where they are, because it doesn't really matter. It's not a secret. And I don't care if you apply for the same shit I apply for. Um, There's so many people applying for these tags. Another couple It's like, it's not really going to change the odds or the statistics. So listen, as always, I love doing this shit. So if there's any way I can help you guys, emails, Jay at mindfulhunter.com. Instagram is mindful underscore hunter. You can find this podcast on YouTube at mindful underscore hunter, or you can go to the journal of mountain hunting and they've got the beyond the kill podcast website through the journal of mountain hunting or search beyond the kill on any podcast platform. And you'll find us. There's new podcasts popping up on this network all the time. As season winds down, I'm really looking forward to like creating a lot of content as far as hunt preps, like how to book super cool hunts and and how to get into some places where maybe you were too nervous to go before. And I I hope I, you know, am able to help you guys kind of get into a lot of that stuff. So anyways, going to wrap it up today. Hope you guys like the podcast. Talk to you next week.